Cheap work. We tell them the truth, can you take it? Some hear the truth and can't face it. Some say the truth too invasive. That's why the truth isn't famous. We tell them the truth, can you take it? Some hear the truth and can't face it. Some say the truth too invasive. That's why the truth isn't famous. Some get offended. Some get offended. Some get inspired. Some work it for truth. Work it for truth. Okay. All right, uh, we're good. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Ritchie. I have been uh, pastoring and evangelizing since 1996, actually an elder in 1993, and pastoring and evangelizing in New York since 1996. And uh, I've written a lot of books and did a lot of research. I've always felt called to apologetics. Buddhism, I research on archaeology and history and evidence that supports the faith. But uh, more recently, in the past few years, I've been focusing on theology against Trinitarianism, Arianism, and Unitarian Sinianism. And so I pretty much give my life to the Word of God in prayer. I thank God I'm, I'm repeating. And I enjoy communicating the gospel of Jesus with everyone I meet. And so I just love having fun talking about the word of God. And I'm currently right now down in Fort Myers, Florida. We've been down here for a couple of years. All right. Do you want to go ahead, Antoine or Kevin? Some mute your mic. Uh, can you hear me? Am I, am I clear? I know I was shopping up earlier. Uh, you could be clearer. Um, I can hear you, though. Maybe speak a little bit louder or maybe turn the volume Aaron, up. can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Kevin, Aaron, y'all can hear me, too? Yeah, I can hear yep. you. Yeah, okay. you can. I said I want to sound like a robot. Um, yeah, um, I'm Antoine Harris. I've uh, been uh, studying... Uh, I've been a student at Absolute Bible Truth for about nine nine years, almost ten years now. Well, yeah, I think it's nine years, almost ten years. I actually began teaching there, um, became a teacher and associate pastor um, about six years ago. And um, that, uh, after I I grew up in the Methodist African Methodist, probably in about 2000, yeah, about 2008, and uh, kind of started my spiritual journey, asking questions, wanting to get answers, and uh, from that point, I moved on uh, to find absolute Bible of truth, and I've, uh, after putting it to the, uh, the classes, the lessons, and the things that I was learning to the test, I felt and I made it in my home, and uh, I was baptized there back in 2011, maybe 2011, I think it was, and yeah, I've been there ever since, so that's pretty much it. Aaron, can you hear Antoine clearly? Yeah, I can hear him. Uh, I can hear him for the most part. Sometimes he, he he's breaking up, but he's very, uh, I can hear him for the most part. Brother Aaron, you're very clear. Antoine is not so clear. So I don't know if there's anything he can do to clear that up because he's coming in broken and very low volume. But um, Aaron's coming in real clear. I don't know why with the difference. You got headphones, Antoine? Thank you, hon. Yeah. What are you? Antoine's breaking up. You're yeah. breaking up again, Antoine. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank God for my lovely wife. You got the record button going now? Go ahead, Kevin. There you go. All right. Yeah, yeah, Antoine. I don't know. Um, you might be in a bad spot. Um, but having said that, uh, first, first uh, Steve, it's good to have you here. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, I hear you clearly. Okay, great. Uh, so, yeah, for introductions. Uh, my name is Kevin Nyson. Uh, I'm part of the same ministry that uh, both Aaron and uh, Antoine are part of, Absolute Bible Truth. Been there, let's see, probably six years. Um, but I've probably, been, I've probably been teaching maybe maybe like the last five, 
Uh, but being a Christian all my life, um, you know, believing in the word of God, believing Jesus is, is my Lord and Savior. Um, you know, also, you, I think you mentioned earlier that, you know, a part of, a part of your, your research, maybe the last few years, has been, been against, uh, you know, defeating or def uh, refuting uh, Trinitarian, Trinitarianism. Uh, that's something that our ministry has done as well. So it's nice to see that there's alignment there. But um, just overall, you know, glad to have you, you know, on this Zoom session and interested to see what your perspective is. That's great. This is a, this is a way I think we should do things, a friendly, Christ-like discussion. We don't need to be mean-spirited. We don't need to be, you know, putting each other down. Right. But the only thing that I'd like to see here, I think we can have a friendly dialogue, but be nice if we kind of go back and forth without arguing or interrupting each other. And each side could go a little bit here, like a few minutes on one side, a few more minutes on the other. What I don't want to have happen is like three guys against one. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Now, and you'll you'll see like it, it. I can see why you would think the setup, you know, would lend itself to that. But as we get further into this discussion, you'll find that you know this conversation is going to be pleasant. Where this isn't about attacking your view or anything. It's simply about um, because honest, quite honestly, Steve, I don't really know what your view is. So shame on me to try to attack something that I don't even understand. So. You know, we got to do like the Bible says, you know, um, uh, let every matter be established, uh, you know, but we're going to let you we're going to let you, you know, talk, get your point across. And there's not going to be any interruptions on our part. OK, I see Antoine Harris's picture there. What was your name again, sir? Oh, uh, sure. My name is Kevin. Kevin. OK, yeah. I'll call you Kevin. Is that OK? That, that's perfectly fine. All right, Kevin. Um, yeah. So maybe it would be a good idea. I'm just suggesting to Aaron. Um, that maybe I could just maybe do a quick two minute or something introduction to what we believe in and this way, you know, what we believe in just a real brief synopsis. And then you could just kind of go back and forth, whether it's two, three minutes each, each or how you want to do it. It's like, we're not doing an official moderated debate here or anything. We're doing just a dialogue and a friendly discussion, but in the yeah, we're yeah. Very, we're very very so we could, go back and forth about our views and look at the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? Is that okay? What do you think, uh, Brother Aaron? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I just hope impromptu off the top of my head, the main distinction or difference between oneness theology and uh, Trinitarian theology, first of all, is we do not believe that the Son of God is a timeless God the Son. I think we can agree with that. We believe that the sun was made, but we do not believe the sun was made before the virgin conception. We believe the sun was preconceived, was foreordained and foreknown in the mind and plan of God, which is his divine expressed divine utterance, his logos. And then when the word of God was made flesh, John 1, 14, that's when the son of God lived in the virgin daughter of a man. Jesus is called son of God, son of man, because of the virgin conception. He's not uh, a son of man because he was a son of man before the virgin conception because son of man means son of mankind because Mary is the virgin daughter of a human being, a man. And so we believe that, that God, Jesus said in John 6, 38, came down from heaven. I came down from heaven. We compare that with Matthew 1, 20, Luke 1, 35. We find in the, the angel was saying, you're going to have a virgin conceived son and Mary said, how can these things be? See, I don't know a man. And then the angel responded by saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So the reason why the Son of God is called the Son of God is not because he's a timeless son or a created angelic son, but because the Holy Spirit came upon the virgin to manifest himself in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, to be made fully human in every way, Hebrews 2, 17. So we believe that Jesus is not God with us as God. We believe Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us in true and full human existence. Thus, we believe in the distinction between the Father, God as God outside the virgin conception, who never had to change, never left heaven, because he's omnipresent. I'm Yahweh, I change not. And the Son is the, the man who had a beginning by his virgin begetting, that's why it says in John 5, 26, as the father has a life in himself, so also has he granted the son a life in himself. The life that was granted was a human life in himself, not an angelic, free, virgin-conceived life. 
So although the scriptures talk about Jesus Christ as the lamb slain for the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1, 15, Colossians 1, 18, that firstborn is talking about the firstborn from the dead. So we know Jesus wasn't literally slain or literally firstborn before his actual death outside of Jerusalem at Calvary. That's just a brief synopsis of basically what we believe. I could go on a long time explaining it, but you know basically what I'm talking about. So we don't deny the deity of Jesus. We just don't believe he's a timeless God, the Son. We believe he's an extension or manifestation of the face of the Father in a true and full human existence. So would you like to uh, respond uh, to, you know, go from there a few minutes? And what do you believe? Maybe you can explain your your views exactly, because I think it's like a semi-Aryan type view. Where yeah, just go ahead, uh, Antoine or Kevin. Okay, um, I'll go. Um, yeah, so a couple of things, Steve. I appreciate, you know, the, the, the breakdown. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, basically your view is that <clears throat> Jesus did not have any kind of existence um, prior to when he was actually born? That is not, that is not true. Uh, he didn't have any human existence. He didn't have an angelic existence, but he had an existence as the spirit of God. Because Jesus claimed divine prerogatives and divine identity so many times in scripture, you know, when he said before Abraham was, I am, you know, he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Where Jesus said, you know, I am the God, where he said to Abraham, uh, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, it showed that he not only existed on the earth as a man, but outside the virgin, uh, virgin conception, he existed as the spirit of God. That's why it says that the Holy Spirit came over the virgin in Luke 135. And again, in Matthew 120, it says that Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that child, which has been conceived in her, is preposition ek, ek out from the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came ek out from the Holy Spirit of God to reproduce character in Hebrews 1, 3, a male child. So Jesus is called the image of the invisible God as the image of the invisible father. He's not just an image like the first Adam, because John 1, 18 says, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son, only begotten is translated from monogamous, and we also, only begotten means one of a kind or unique son. So Jesus is a one of a kind son where Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus is the brightness of his, the Father's glory, and the express character copy image of his hypostasis, of his person or being. So Jesus is the essence of being with the Father, reproduced or copied as a true human being to save his people from their sins. That's why scriptures like Zechariah 12 talks about, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and Yahweh says that. And, you know, that could go on and on with that, but that's, so that explains the scriptures that deal with the humanity of Jesus, praying and being led by the Spirit, the capacity to be tempted, but also explains the scriptures that talk about his pre-existence because he came from heaven. Now, that's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective because <clears throat> I was under, like, the little bit that I did know about your view, right? And it truly was a little bit. Um, I was under the impression that you, your stance was Jesus did not exist in any shape or form prior to him actually being born. And upon being born as a human being in sinful flesh, as Romans chapter 8 verse 2 tells us, or Romans chapter 8 verse 3, right. um, you know, then he proceeded into, you know, living his life and, and, and you know, obtaining a eternal existence. But it seems to me that you acknowledge that Jesus existed um, as a sentient being prior to when he came in, in the physical flesh. I just want to make sure that that point is clear, just so I don't, um, I don't yeah. misrepresent your, your position. While there's a lot of similarities between us and a Unitarian Sassanian position, which we believe that Jesus was sent in the flesh, 
John, what, 17, 18 says, as you sent me into the world, speaking of the Father, so I have also sent them, his disciples, into the world. Since scripture can't contradict scripture, Jesus was not sent from heaven to earth. He was sent after he was born of a woman, made of a woman, made under the law, Galatians 4, 4. Then he was sent in the flesh, Romans 8, 3. He was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. So flesh wasn't sent from heaven to earth. But when the word was made flesh in the virgin conception, that's when the son of God was sent into the world. So we agree with the Unitarian Sicinians in that aspect. That as the son, the son is the man, the man is the son. But he who became the child born son given in Isaiah 9, 6. His true divine identity is the mighty God and eternal or everlasting father. That's why the angel gave the name Jesus in Hebrew, which means Yahweh saves to Joseph. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Yahweh saves, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus has the divine name of his father. And that's why Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, I'll raise to David a righteous branch and a king shall reign. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahweh. So he wasn't called Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible, but the son was given the father's name, according to Philippians 2.9, uh, Hebrews 1.4. He has, he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than the angels. And again in John chapter 17, verse 8. I believe it's John 17, 11. John 17, 11. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, keep them through your name, the name which you have given me. So the father's name was given to the son, and the son inherits all things from his father. Because God will not give his glory to another, so he has to be the divine identity to receive the glory and authority, and all men would honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And if we're honoring the Son just as we honor the Father, then he's got to be that God who came to save us in a new human manifestation. That's what one of the Pentecostals, one of the theology teaches. So earlier you mentioned that um, you drew a distinction between um, – uh, Jesus being an angelic being and being, um, I, I believe you said he, he was either the Holy Spirit or a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Talk, talk to us a little bit about why you made that distinction, because it's, it's one that I quite honestly, I haven't, I haven't heard anybody make uh, establishing the point that Jesus wasn't an angelic being. Have you come across people in your travels that have tried to make that argument? Okay, you don't believe that Jesus was an angelic being before the virgin conception? What exactly do you believe? Because I'm not well, sure. Well, sure. So when you say angelic being, because see, when I when I when I hear the word angel or angelic, I specifically think of a messenger of God, right? right? And what I mean by messenger of God, um, and a, a, a messenger that was created by God um, specifically to do to do His will. Say, like you know, as we see in the Old Testament, you saw you know right. an angel of the Lord. Um, uh, led Israel out of the wilderness, right? And then we see, you know, the angel, we see an angel uh, roll the rock back uh, from Jesus' grave when, uh, or after he was, he was resurrected. So that's specifically what I think of when I think of angel. So when you make the statement that Jesus wasn't an, an, wasn't an angelic being, um, I obviously agree with that, but I was just curious to see why you made that distinction because it, 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 lends, it, it leads me to believe that there's people out here who claim that he's an angel. And what I mean by angel, not simply a messenger, like an angel as, as, uh, as I defined previously in my two examples. Okay, so I'm not, not quite clear about your doctrine then. From my with Aaron, uh, you believe that Jesus existed. He was created before the virgin conception as some sort of heavenly being. Yes. God confess he was an angel in any way. So what kind of heavenly being was he? Well, I think there's, I think when you talk about heavenly beings, um, you have, uh, from our understanding, right? So you would have God the Father, you would have Jesus, and you would have the angels. All of them are spiritual beings, but not all of them are angels, if that makes, if that distinction makes sense. Okay. So you believe that Jesus is a spiritual being, but not necessarily an angel. Well, he, he's an angel if you're using the word angel as far as meaning simply a messenger. Okay. But as far as like, as far as being in the, the, the order of angels, if you will. Right. So like, for example, Ezekiel, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter one uh, talks about uh, certain classes of angel. You have the, you have the cherubim. And right. then it also talks in later places about the seraphim. 
we don't believe Jesus is a cherubim or a seraphim. Those would be classes of angels. Okay, so what do you believe Jesus is then? We believe Greater that than the angels. Yeah, go ahead, Antoine. Go ahead. We believe he was made greater than the angels. Greater than the angels. Yeah. He was not an angel, but he's greater. Than... <laughs> Is that it? Yes. Okay. A spiritual being greater than the angels. Okay. So can you point to a scripture where it says in the Hebrew Bible that Jesus is a spiritual being, but greater than the angels? You, can you point to a scripture anywhere from Genesis to Malachi where there's a scripture that specifically says that Jesus is a spiritual being, but yet not one of the angels? You still there? Yeah, Antoine, are you there? Or how about anybody else? <laughs> I think we lost him. Antoine must be Frank. Because, you know, what, what's so important, you know, we can speculate all day and, you know, we can come up with all kinds of ideas and try to read between the lines of scripture. Well, well that, that all goes into us believing that he came down from heaven and that. He, yeah, hello? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? I hear, yeah. Hello? I hear hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, dude. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, I got, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So what, what were you saying again? I, I said, can you, you point, can you point to a verse of scripture anywhere in the Hebrew Bible from Genesis to Malachi to show that Jesus Christ is a spiritual being that literally existing as a living being without being an angel? Because you said he's not without an angel. Being. Without being, it, well, like, it's like Kevin. It's like Kevin asked you, like when you're saying angel, do you mean just because, like, what? What? I need to understand your definition of, of angel. What, what are you saying it as? Definition of angel. If, you mean? Someone that's created by God as a spiritual being before mankind was created. And I think there are different classifications. Some people might say they're seraphim, cherubim, or angels. To me, I put them in the same category. All creations before humankind was created was some sort of angelic, whether it be different angelic orders, uh, different types of angels. I would say different types of angels, but I haven't heard anybody say that Jesus Christ was created as a spiritual being who was not an angel. That's my curiosity as to your beliefs. The typical Aryan or some uh, no. Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach that Jesus Christ is like Michael, the archangel, or one of the big chief angels, but you don't believe that. No, we, no, we don't. We don't believe that. Um, Michael the Archangel is Michael the Archangel. Right. Um, but um, yeah, no, it, it all ties in and um, to our belief. I think I, I don't know if it's in the Book of Hebrews where it talks about uh, him being made much more or much greater than the angels um, as a different uh, being. I don't know how you feel about uh, apocryphal books. We read the. Uh, we read the Septuagint as well as uh, other books uh, that you out of quoted in the New Testament. Um, we read we read those as well that he existed before then and actually been in heaven. We don't believe that you know flesh and blood uh, has been there, so we believe only that the spirit can be there. So that that alone you know says that he's a spiritual being. If that's, I mean, from my belief now, if you don't believe that, can, can y'all hear me or am I breaking up? I can't. Uh, we can hear you, but I mean, you are breaking up, but we, at least I Hello? can hear you clear enough. Yeah. Hello? I can hear you. Yeah. I think that you're referencing Hebrews 1, 4, having become so much better than the right. I just, I know, I know. Since obtained a more excellent name than they. Is that the scripture you're talking about, Hebrews? Have he become so much better than the angels? So it's showing he's not an angel right there. That's a good point back there. He says, have he become so much better than the angels? And again, in Hebrews 1.5, uh, cites Psalm 2.7, uh, where it says, uh, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son this day have I begotten you? That's a quote from Psalm 2.7, where the Hebrew word yalad 
which literally means to give birth to. The Hebrew word Yalad is used for the births of Cain and Abel. The same Hebrew word as Psalm 2, 7 is used for the births of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, 1 and 2. So God never said to any of the angels, you are my son this day, have I given birth to you? Because the giving of birth is to the right. son of God, not to a pre-created spiritual angel or angelic being. Or if you don't want to call him an angel, if he's better than the angels or a higher level above the angels, uh, then he, he could not uh, really be born. The only way Jesus Christ was born was via virgin conception. He wasn't literally born before the virgin conception in Mary's womb. So we believe that the... We, we, don't, disagree with, we, don't, we don't disagree with that. As a son. We don't, we don't disagree with any of that. So, so Steve, to, to that point, because um, like Antoine said, we don't, we, we don't claim that, you know, Jesus, when he was prior to his, you know, earthly existence, he was the angel Michael. We don't believe any of that at all. But where I'm still confused is your view of Jesus pre, pre like as a being pre- uh, pre his earthly his earthly walk because like you, like you said earlier you acknowledge that he existed in some form but it seems like the form that you believe Jesus existed in prior to um, you know being human was a form that was tangible you know like a certain people might say well you know Jesus before before um, before you know he was a human being he existed in thought in the mind of in the mind of God as a thought. But it seems to me that your view is like, no, Jesus existed in tangible, in tangible spiritual form. Um, but yet, you, but yet, you know, you seem to, you, you don't, I don't know if I heard a cl like how you would classify that unless you're saying that Jesus was in fact the Holy Spirit. Um, so if you could just clarify that a bit, because I just want to make sure I'm understanding your viewpoint correctly. Okay. Um, well, we don't believe Jesus, you know, I, some, I have to clarify this too. Not all people that believe in oneness theology believe exactly the same thing. As I had my debate with Sam Shamoon, uh, there are a lot of oneness that believe that God could have appeared in an angelic form, but it wasn't a God, the son. It wasn't a, another being. He just used some sort of form, some sort of morphe in Greek to appear himself through. I was taught that in a oneness Bible school, but I've since turned my belief against that. It just doesn't make sense with Acts 7.35 where the scripture says that God spoke through to Moses by the hand of the angel in the bush. By the hand of the angel doesn't sound like that's God himself. That's by a messenger. And there's right. other scriptures to back that up. But we don't believe that God has, me personally, anyhow, I don't believe that God has a tangible form. He's invisible. And uh, I, I, like, for example, you know, and I use other extra biblical books as well. My favorite, of course, is, um, let me just go to this real quick. My favorite is uh, people that were taught by the apostles like Ignatius of Antioch, and he died in about 8107. Pull them up real quick here. If I can, you know, the liking. Okay. Give me a second. Here you go. Okay. I just want to just give a cut. This is very interesting because these are the seven genuine epistles of Ignatius. Ignatius, Ephesians 18.2 says, For our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and from the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, his true human identity, came from the seed of the woman, Mary, from the tribe of Judah, David, and from the Holy Spirit. So he received his essence of being from the Holy Spirit, and his humanity from Mary. Magnesius 15.1 says, you have obtained the inseparable spirit who is Jesus Christ. So the early ap apostles taught their first successors, like Ignatius was taught, mentored by the apostle John, and they were teaching that Jesus Christ received his being from the Holy Spirit and from Mary. Ignatius of Antioch to Polycarp 3.2, look for him who is above all time, the timeless, the invisible, who for our sake became visible. So over and over, Ephesians 19.5 says, God appeared in the likeness of man, God himself being manifested in human form, Ephesians 19.3. Ephesians 7.2 says, 
Uh, there is one physician who was possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made. See, the son was made as a man, but not made, not created. He was made as a human being in the virgin conception, but he was not made. He never was created because Ignatius taught God existing in flesh. True life and death, both of Mary and of God, both of Mary, human, and of God, and divine. So these are the earliest Christian writings we have of the first century uh, bishops that were taught and mentored by the Apostle John. And I see in church history the later development of a, of a semi-Aryan type view, which led to Trinitarianism, where like Justin Martyr about the mid-second century started teaching that Jesus was an angel and that Jesus was a second God after the Father, according to the words of Justin, as a lesser God, a subordinate God person. And that's what kind of led to the full-blown Aryan doctrine and eventual Jehovah's Witness and different type of semi-Aryan beliefs. I would kind of classify your, your view as like a semi-Aryan view uh, because it's not just like the teachings of Arius, but it's similar to that because you believe that there was son was created before the conception as some sort of heavenly being, whether you want to call him an angel or not, but that would be a subordinate lesser God under the father. Am I correct? Uh, yeah. Um, and, and a couple of things. First, when you say, um, cause I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm just looking for, for a little bit more clarity. Um, when you, when, when you, when you talk about, you know, the, the invisible nature of God, do you believe that God can be both invisible and tangible? Because, I don't believe okay. that God as God, because I am Yahweh, I change not. I don't believe God as God is visible, tangible. No man has seen God at any time. And of course, if, if like a Trinitarians were to say in, that in John 1, 18, that a God, the son could be seen and the father could be seen, well, then he wouldn't be truly God because God as God is not seen by man. The only way that God could be seen is through visions, through dreams, in a, you know, in a, maybe some sort of manifestation, but it's not a physical, tangible form. Well, now, let me, let, let me clarify, because I, I think I see where you're going with this. When I say that God is tangible, I don't mean tangible from our perspective. I mean tangible in his own realm. Because think of, like, and here's, I'll give you an example. So in Revelation chapter 20, right, if I go to Revelation chapter 20, I'll show you uh, why I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, Revelation, let me see here. Yeah, so Revelation chapter 20, uh, Verse seven says this, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, you I think you would agree that Satan is an a or is a, we'll say he's a spiritual being because people have different ideas on what kind of angel he is, if he is an angel, whatever. But the point being is Satan is a spiritual being. Yet right. in verse seven, it says that he was loosed from his prison. Now, right. there was no human being that loosed him from his prison. There was some other uh, uh, spiritual celestial entity that, that loosed him from his prison or that will loose him from his prison. So if there's somebody that can actually free Satan from his prison, then that means that Satan himself is tangible and that the person that released him from prison is also tangible because there's a, there, there's a, there's a prison, whether it be some type of spiritual bars or, or, or locks, I don't know. But that's what I mean by tangible. Somebody actually loosed him from his prison. He, this, this wasn't like an idea or a thought. Also, when you go to Ezekiel, you read for our chapter one, you read about actual descriptions of the cherubim. And you read about how, you know, uh, in, one, in, in one particular case, uh, the cherubim had four heads. And it goes on to describe, you know, the, the different bodily aspects of the cherubim. That, that shows tangibility. Now, we, from a human perspective, obviously can't touch that. But if I'm a spiritual being and I'm operating in the celestial realm, then my fellow celestial beings are tangible to me. I hope that makes sense. Well, the scripture says in Hebrews... Uh... He makes his, his angels, let's see, he makes his ministers a flame of fire. You know, they're, they're spirit beings. They're like a flame of fire. I don't, I don't believe they're physical or tangible. Revelation talks about Satan being in, the, in a place called the bottomless pit. There's no bottom to it. So there's, 
there's something there. There's no ending to the bottom. I mean, that's, it doesn't sound like a physical thing. I believe that God could make some sort of spiritual ability to box Satan in without having real physical, tangible bars, uh, without having him being able to travel and move around the earth. The Bible speaks of Satan going up and down through the earth. Well, somehow God's going to lock him out of the earth in some spiritual manner that we can only guess. But I, I look at the scriptures as the angels are ministering spirits. A spirit has not flesh and blood. Um, the angels are invisible too, unless God decides or, or the angels have permission by God to appear as men, like the three angels, I believe, that appeared to Abraham and actually sat down and ate and drank with Abraham. So I, I think they have the ability to manifest themselves in a physical form. Certainly God has that ability if he wants to. I don't believe that God is has a physical morphe or form, but certainly that God did reveal himself anthropomorphically in visions because the prophet saw one, Isaiah 6, one being on the throne, never more than one. And we never find God before the virgin conception, before the ascension, God existing with an, a son right next to him. It was only after the virgin conception where Psalm 110 one says, Yahweh said to my Adoni, my human Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool over your feet. So Jesus was not at the right hand of the Father until his resurrection and ascension into heaven. That's why God prophetically said to his future child born and son given, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool over your feet. So the son is, is the man who had his beginning by his virgin beginning, resurrected, went into the lower part of Hades, and then ascended above, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things in Ephesians 4.10. So Jesus, this is the amazing thing. Jesus ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things because God has always filled all things. But the new human manifestation of the face of the father as a son now fills all things. That's why Jesus said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it in John 14, 14. And how Jesus can send the spirit. Luke 24, 49 says, I send the promise of the father. He was talking about Joel 2, 28, where Yahweh said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then John the Baptist said in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I believe it is, uh, I baptize you with, um, um, with the baptism of water. The one comes after me, whose latch of shoes I'm not worthy to untie, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus baptizes with the Spirit of God, that's doing the works of God the Father. And in John, uh, John chapter 10, he said, if you don't believe me, then believe me for the work's sake that I'm doing the works of God the Father. So he didn't claim to do the works of a God the Son or the works of a, a lesser God person. He claimed to do the works of God the Father by sending the Spirit, by hearing and answering prayers, and indwelling all New Testament believers. For example, John 16, uh, Jesus said, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not nor knows him, but you know him, the Spirit of truth, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave his orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus identified himself as the spirit of truth who would come into the disciples. He was with them in the flesh, but he'd later be in them in the spirit. That's why you find so many scriptures that says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 27, Romans 8, 9. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwells in you, that if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So having the spirit of Christ and the, and the spirit of God is spoken interchangeably. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the Lord is the spirit in the context of preaching for Jesus Christ as the Lord. So you put all the scriptural data together like a jigsaw puzzle, we find that, that the true divine identity of Jesus, like I quoted from Ignatius, the inseparable spirit, which is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is spoken of in two different facets or manifestations. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is spoken of as the Spirit of God the Father, and other times the Holy Spirit is spoken of as the Son, the Spirit of the Son in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. So when God became one of us, that new life, like I said in John 5, 26, as the father has life in himself, so also he's granted the son life in himself. That new human life had to have independent human reason, reasoning, independent human cognition, and an independent human will. But before the virgin conception, there was no independent son will until the child was born, the son was given, and grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Well, let me let me introduce these set of scriptures uh, in light of what you just said, uh, just so I can get your, your perspective on this. So Colossians 1 verse 12 
uh, and some of the subsequent verses says this. It says, Colossians 1, uh, Colossians 1 uh, verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. And I'm reading out of the King James, um, yeah. which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principles or powers, all things were created by him. When I read these verses, it indicates to me that the son, you know, the one that we've been translated into in, or we've been translated into uh, regarding his kingdom existed prior to physical flesh, because it says in verse 15, uh, who is the image meaning Jesus of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature for by him, by who, by Jesus were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, et cetera, et cetera. So if, how do you explain Jesus not having an existence, if you will, prior to uh, his physical, his physical um, existence when these verses seem to indicate that? I'm glad you brought this one up. It, it actually, if you look at the text in its entirety, it actually shows what it's talking about. The actual King James uses by, but the Greek preposition is and for in. So it reads like this. He is the image of the invisible God, the prototokos, the firstborn of all creation for Greek preposition in. For in him, not by him there, for in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. So we're not just talking about things on the earth that were created, but both invisible things and invisible things, whether things in heaven, that would include the angels, and things on the earth, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. Again, we're talking about all things, not just some things. So all of the creation was created in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ in a different sense than most people think. Because when you look at the scripture, the Genesis act of creation, the thrones, the lordships, the dominions, rulers, and authorities of all human history were not literally created in Christ in the Garden of Eden because Adam and Eve were alone. Adam was first, then Eve. So we know this is talking about God already foreordaining, predestined all things. That's why Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says that he chose us in him before the creation or foundation of the world. And in verse 5 said he predestined us through dia, dia in the genitive, through Jesus Christ. So God, God predestined his elect through Jesus Christ. It's in that sense that Colossians 1.15 is talking about God creating all things like a heavenly blueprint. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.5. So when you look at the context, you go down to verse 18, it's the clincher. It says, Pertoptikos again. It says, firstborn of all creation. Now, Pertoptikos is used again in verse 18. He is the beginning. How is Jesus the beginning? the prototokos, the firstborn from the dead. Now, if this is a literal you, um, the being or angelic or whatever you want to call it, a literal being up in heaven, how is that being the firstborn from the dead? Did Jesus die up in heaven before his virgin conception? It says firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have the first place in everything. So this is talking about Jesus being, according to Revelation 13, 8, the lamb which was slain before the foundation of the world. He wasn't literally slain before the foundation of the world. He wasn't literally the firstborn from the dead before the foundation of the world. Neither was he literally born before the foundation of the world. Because Romans 4, 17 says, God calls the things just be not as though they were. God already viewed the crucifixion, the birth, the resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ as accomplished events. And that's why we have so many scriptures, they pierce my hands and my feet as if it happened already. And then you go to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, uh, th by him or through him, he made the ailments, the ages. This ages is not a physical thing. It means a time period. We know that God created the timing, his planning of all the human ages before the world was even created in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ, because Christ is the central purpose and reason for all of God's creation, because God foreknew 
that he would rule and reign and he would manifest himself to rule and reign on the throne of his glory where Revelation 22, 3 says the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. It's always been God's intention to live among men as the tabernacle of God with men. I could just keep going on and on, but there's so many other scriptures I could back that up with, but I want to be fair to you to responding back and forth. No, no worries. Um, first, we believe, um, we obviously believe, you know, the resurrection of the dead and that Jesus is the firstborn from that. But the way that, the way that I read Colossians 1, 12 through, I mean, 22, is almost like an unfolding of events, right? Because verse 15 specifically says firstborn of every creature. Verse 18 says firstborn from the dead. And as you read the text, it's an unfolding of events. So let's say, let's say, you know, I take the perspective of someone that doesn't believe that Jesus created all things prior to uh, the existence of humanity. Let's say I simply believe God did it. And as I read this, I'm reading about God and not Jesus. The bottom line is that prior to the, 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 the point in history when we have a firstborn from the dead, or we have, um, as verse 20 says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, before we get to this event, mankind and the rest of creation was created. So that that fits first or that that uh, that's the first event chronologically speaking. So I don't see verse 15 as a, a, a particular verse that talks about the resurrection of the dead. I see verse 15 as talking about uh, I'm sorry, not the resurrection of the dead. I don't see verse 15 as talking about the firstborn from the dead. I see verse 15 yeah. as talking about the firstborn of every creature. Do you fit? Do you see the phrase? Firstborn of every creature as a synonymous phrase to firstborn from the dead? Well, I just read verse 18. Verse 18 goes on to say, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. So how was Jesus Christ the beginning? He was the beginning as the firstborn from the dead. For sure. So at the beginning before the foundation of the world, God already through his divine logos, his divine utterances, had already foreordained the son. The son was foreknown before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 20. And so all things about the son were already foreordained and predestined by God, spoken by God's divine word. That's why Isaiah 41, 4 says, who hath performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning. So the generations or time periods of all human history were called forth by God's word, his divine logos, his divine utterance, by his word, therefore God foreknew his elect. That's why Romans 8, 29, 30 says, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, patatikos, the same in patatikos used twice in Colossians 1, 15, and again in Colossians 1, 18, the firstborn from the dead, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Jesus was firstborn in God's prophetic mind and planning, his prophetic anticipation of future events. Then after Jesus was chosen, he chose us in him. So we were born after the firstborn too as God's elect. Not literally, this is because we don't believe that we were literally alive before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So we know that we weren't alive. So likewise, Jesus as a son was not alive as to, as to that aspect of his being. He, as a son, as a creation, as being made of a woman, he was made like unto his brethren that means he was made like unto his human brethren in Hebrews 2.17. But no verse of scripture said that the son of God was made as a heavenly being. That's just an assumption by, uh, by a lot of semi-Aryan, Aryan type believers. And of course, Trinitarians go right into that. They, they, they believe that a lot of them kind of talk just like Aryans, just like Sam Shamoon does. In fact, he said Chris LaSala, who is probably a lot of beliefs like yours, he said that, he, that his beliefs were more orthodox in line with Trinitarian thought. So he, he's, he's a very compromising there. He's not a real true Trinitarian either, Sam Shimon. He's more like what you guys believe, apparently, because he, he, he considers me a heretic, but he considers Chris LaSala uh, uh, an orthodox believer, <laughs> even though uh, Chris LaSala believes that the son was created and not, not a second person of a trinity. So to that point, when you read Romans chapter eight, because you mentioned like um, you mentioned about, you know, uh, Christ, like when the scriptures that talk about uh, or at least I should say from your perspective, seem to talk about Jesus preexisting before his humanity. Um, let me get your perspective on this verse. Right. Because 
And we kind of touched on it earlier, but we should probably do, uh, delve into it more specifically. Now, Romans chapter three, ver- I'm sorry, Romans chapter eight, verse three uh, says this, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemning sin in the flesh. Now, one might say, okay, well, this is talking about when Jesus um, was obviously born into mankind in in the in uh, in, uh, in a physical body, but the way that it's re- that this uh, particular verse reads is God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. If Jesus was simply born in sinful flesh, then what aspect of God or what aspect of Jesus was sent uh, into the likeness of sinful flesh if He was just simply born into humanity and not and not ex- and did not exist prior to that? Well. It says the likeness of sinful flesh. It didn't say that Jesus was born in sinful flesh. The likeness is not the same thing. Jesus was completely innocent. He didn't actually come in sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Sinful flesh. So there the text is very clear to me in Romans 8, 3, that the son was sent in the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. So if Jesus didn't come down from heaven in the likeness of flesh, and again, it says in Hebrews 2, 17, that he was made like unto his human brethren. Holy human in every way. Right. Son was made in f- the word. When the word was made flesh in John 1, 14, that's when the virgin conception took place. The flesh wasn't before the virgin conception. Though God foreknew the body of Christ, the body wasn't formed until the word was made flesh. The body was formed within the virgin conception. That was the beginning of the human child born and son given. We don't have a timeless God the child or child born son given. The child that was born the son was given was in the Hebrew virgin conception. That's what we believe, and that's what the scriptures bear out. Hello? Did I yep. lose you? I'm here. I could keep going, but I want to be respectful to let you guys go back and forth with me here. <laughs> oh, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, oh, you, you're right. Right. All right. I don't, I don't want to do that. It's not fair. <laughs> you guys no, no, no yeah. problem. Um, like I said, I understand, I understand your perspective. Um, you know, this is going to be one of the things where, because um, I'm, I'm only hearing your perspective for the first time, I'll have to take in what you're saying and then go do more research on it um, because I'm not the type of person that um, is going to act like I fully understand your view. Uh, Hence my questions. Like it's not about trying to trap you or do anything like that. I'm simply asking questions to better understand your view. Um, You know, and thus far, I appreciate you coming on just to share that with us. Well, Uh, I I, I tell you, this is the best forum to do it on when you think about it. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Right. Advertising and written buildings and, you know, a lot thousands of people could watch something like this. We post it. It'd be interesting to go back and forth and, we could go uh, do this again and again. I love doing this. This is fun. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> and, and Steve, do you have a, um, cause I don't know. I don't even know anything about your ministry. Do you have like an online ministry, brick and mortar church? Uh, what do you, what do you got going? So on? I have an international ministry on our website called apostolic Christian faith.com apostolic okay. Christian faith.com. I also have a YouTube channel called global impact ministries. You type in global impact ministries. You get quite a few, uh, but if you put Global Impact Ministries and you type in the word apostolic, it'll come right up. Got it. Yeah, I'm on the website now. Yeah, because, um, yeah, I, I've got to look more into um, into what you believe, um, you know, for me to have a more in-depth conversation. But, you know, I appreciate you, you know, sharing your, your perspective. Because, um, like I said, I'm not the type of person, like, if you bring up scriptures, I'm not going to ignore them. Uh, but it will require me to do more research. Oh, yeah, you? I'm on your I'm on your website right now. Kevin Appreciate Aaron, it. Antoine Harris. Who am I talking to now? Um, this is Kevin again. Kevin, okay. I don't see your name up there, Kevin. I apologize. No worries. Introduce yourself to me, and I just don't see your name. Yeah, here. yeah his name says Sword of the Flock. All right, Kevin. Well, you know what? If I could ask a question, because I'm curious as to your belief, because you have, you know, there's many types of uh, professing Christian believers and different, you know, slants. You believe that Jesus Christ is God's agent in creation and God used Christ to create all things. Is that what you believe? Yes. The Father God created Christ or created some sort of heavenly superior yeah. being and used that superior being to create all things to that superior being. Yes. That's what I believe. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you a question about this. Uh, Isaiah 44, 24 says, thus says Yahweh, the Lord, capital L O R D Hebrew tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Y S W H. Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, he who formed you from the womb. I am Yahweh, who makes all things, who stretched out the heavens all alone, 
who spread abroad the earth by myself. So here Yahweh said he created all things alone and by himself. Then we go to Isaiah 64, 8. You are our father. Oh, Yahweh, it says. Oh, Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And we are all the works of your hands. So Yahweh, our father, we are all the works of your hands. And then Hebrews 2, 7, cites Psalm 8, 5, and 6, says you have made him. Now we know Hebrews 2, 7 is talking about we see Jesus in verse 9, who was made a little lower than the angels, who was, uh, who was made a little lower than the angels for the sufferings of death and was crowned with glory and honor. So we know that Psalm 8, 5, and 6 is applied by the inspired author of Hebrews to Jesus Christ being the one crowned with glory and honor. So you read Psalm 8, 5, and 6 referencing Jesus because Hebrews 2, 7 proves it. It says, you have made him, the son, Jesus, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him, the son, with glory and honor. You have set him, the son, Jesus, over the works of your hands. So the son was set to rule or have dominion over the works of God the Father's hands. So these three passages of scriptures here, Isaiah 44, 24, Isaiah 64, 8, Psalm 8, 5, and 6, which is side Hebrews 2, 7, are very emphatic that the God, our only heavenly Father, created all things alone and by himself, and he has appointed the Son to rule over the works of his hands. So then how can you say that the Son, or a pre-human Son, some superior heavenly being, beside the Father, who is not that God and Father, created all things. What's the scriptural justification from Genesis to Malachi that would say that God created all things through a son or through a heavenly being? Uh, sure, I'll answer that. So a lot of this goes back to what I read in First, I'm sorry, uh, in Colossians 1.15. Uh, I'm sorry, in Colossians uh, one. Uh, 116 which says for in him as you said because it depending on depending on the verse um the word the word that it, the uh the greek word that is used for by could mean in or by um it depends on the verse but let's say actually in colossians 115 with 116 it actually is greek preposition in it really does mean in i don't that's a lot of trinitarian translators always like but by but many translations like niv and others say in it is for, most proper it is in because by is could you break by. Okay, what does that N mean? Could you break that down? What does N mean? What in that situation? Preposition, E-N, you can look it up anywhere. You can look up uh, any kind of lexicon or anything you want to look. Uh, I like to go to Bible Hub, and it gives the exact breakdown uh, of the Greek. Very good, very good program, and it says, for in him all things are great. So, Steve, real quick, uh, do you believe... Do you so what does that mean? By, what do you mean? What does it mean? Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I was I was asking him to break could, could you break that down as far as in him, in him that phrase in him means. Yeah, I'm not a King James only advocate. That's why there's no perfect translation. That's why I look at a lot of translations. Look at the Greek. Look at the Hebrew because sometimes we agree. you get it wrong. And as you can see, there's many translations. Many of them say, "For in him all things are created." Then later we, we agree by him and through him is correct. The dia word, dia means by or through. That's why Ephesians 1, 5 says that by or through him, we were, it says we were predestined dia through Jesus Christ. We were predestined to the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ. Through is dia. So that's a through. So how are we predestined? How are we foreknown? How did God predestine us? Through Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of Colossians 1, 15 through 18. It's talking about God predestinating all things through Christ because Christ means the anointed one. Jesus Christ was anointed as a man on the earth. He was not a pre-incarnated anointed being. He was anointed. That's why it says in Hebrews 1, 8, which is a quote from, I think, Psalm 45. Uh, it says that the son, uh, your throne, O God, Elohim in Hebrew, your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness and the majesty of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate a lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, notice, your God has anointed you, you all of gladness above your companions. So it's talking about his human companions when he was anointed. He wasn't anointed literally before the virgin conception. He was anointed on the earth as a man because there we have Jesus being called Elohim, God, your throne of God. The throne of Jesus, the throne of God in the millennial reign. 
So Jesus is going to sit on the throne of God as the lamb. The man, the son, is going to judge the world in righteousness and sit on the throne of his glory as a true human being. And Isaiah 45, the inhabitants of the millennial reign are going to call Jesus God. They're going to say, uh, your throne, O God. It's a messianic prophecy. They're going to call the throne of God Jesus. He's going to say, your throne of God is forever and ever, looking at Jesus. And then again, the inhabitants of the earth are going to say, uh, surely God is in you. There's none else. There's no other God beside you. Uh, there's no Savior beside God. So Jesus Christ is called the Savior of the world. So it's very important that we understand who Jesus is because Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. In verse 27, it says they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father as to his true divine identity. And if we could maybe extend our little times back and forth because I want to be respectful but I could explain this a lot more thoroughly, but I want to make sure you guys have time to talk and we'll go back and forth equally because I don't want to hog up all the time. That wouldn't be fair of me. No worries, Steve. Um, I think, I think the, the, the topic of N is, is a very important one. Um, and I think you mentioned that N from a, from a Greek perspective, never means by. Is, was that correct? Right. E okay. For in him. It doesn't so, mean by. Trinity. So, so, so can I give you, can I give you several scriptures that from, from our perspective show that it in fact means by, well, it could be translated as by, but that's not the literal meaning. Right. But when you, when, you, when you read the context though, of these verses that I'm about to show you, it the, contextually, it can't mean the, the word in cannot make sense there. Can I show you that? That I would agree with. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I would agree that there are some examples that there are contextually that you might have to translate it for English properly. But in the context of Colossians 1, 15 through 18, for in him fits perfectly. It does not. But, it, but so does by. By fits perfectly too. So if by and in fit perfectly, then the argument can't be made that in Colossians 1, 16, that word N can't mean by, because both contextually yeah, fit. That's the, well, for example, yeah, can, can Ephesians 1 4. Well, well real, real quick, Steve, real, real quick. I just, for the sake of Aaron and for the sake of Aaron and Antoine, I do want to give a scripture that shows, contextually speaking, without a shadow of a doubt, the word N means by. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. Right? And the word by in this particular verse is G 17 22. And here's what it reads it says, For, the, for then shall, by, or, excuse me, for then shall be great tribulation. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm reading from the wrong verse. Sorry. My apologies. That's not the right one. Uh, I was in Matthew 24. Matthew 17, verse 21 says this. How be it this kind goeth not out by or but by prayer and fasting. Right. Mm -hmm. So we know that Jesus was talking about uh, uh, demons or talking about uh, demons being moved. And as a result of that, in verse 21, he says, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. I'll give you another example where contextually speaking, um, the word the word N cannot mean N, right? Let me see here. Uh, I just had it. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So another another example is Matthew chapter two, verse five. Matthew chapter two, verse five says this. Let me see here. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. That word by is the same word used in Colossians 1.16, which is N. But contextually speaking, it would not make sense for this verse to say, for thus it is, for, for thus it is written in the prophet. The well, you could actually say prophet. that. It depends on the language, and there's differences in languages. You could say in the prophet, through the prophet. For our English readers, though, that's not really the way we do it. But I would, I would say that. Different languages can actually use the word in instead of by, but for our English readers, we don't use, we don't speak like that. So I think it's for the English audience. But a good example of N is in the Greek preposition N is in Ephesians 1 4. He chose us in Him for sure. Before the foundation of the world. Greek preposition N means in. So, you know, I, I it, agree with you. Be, I, I agree with you. I think it so really is, um, it, it's not, doesn't really alter much. Uh, but I like to try to literally um, share the scripture as exactly as it teaches. It lines up, you know, with the predestination, 
where the predestination passes in, in Ephesians 1, 4 says, for in him all things were created. Obviously, it, you know, he chose us we? for the foundation of the world. Colossians 1, uh, 16 says, in him all things were created. It makes sense that God created all things in Christ. And then again, Dia, through Christ and for Christ. So I'm not saying that God didn't create all things through Christ or by Christ. Dia means by or through. But it was in Christ, in God's redemptive plan, that God had a heavenly blueprint. Now, just like an earthly architect always has a blueprint. God is a wise God. He created the wisdom for the ages. He created what he was, he did by his divine utterance, he spoke. He called for generations from the beginning, Isaiah 41.4. And then, he, of course, he chose Christ first, firstborn of all creation. And then he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So God didn't just start creating chaotically. He had it all in his logos, his divine utterance, his mind, his reasoning, his planning. That's the meaning of logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. And then when God got ready to create, he already had it all, all the times, the human aeonus, the ages. He, it says, in through him also he made the aeonus, the time periods. So it was in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ that God foreordained the human ages, the visible things and the invisible things, whether it be thrones, lordships, rules, authorities, all things were created by him, through him, and for him in a foreordination sense. See, these, these are the scriptures. You always point to the New Testament, I notice. And these are the very scriptures that Paul clearly uh, for ordination of the Son of God, because we know that time periods, Aeonus in Hebrews 1 2, is not talking about the physical Genesis act of creation. You don't find anything about time periods being created in Genesis chapter 1. The time periods were created by Christ, uh, through Christ, I should say, before the foundation of the world, because Jesus was the reason for all the human Aeonus, all the human ages. And so that's why we turn to Colossians 1 15. He's the first one of all creation. And then verse 18 is the clincher. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So if the past is talking about a literal living, pre-virgin conceived heavenly being, then why would that heavenly being be called the firstborn from the dead? Well, Steve. Because he's been being. Hey, hey, Anton, real quick before you go. Um, okay. Steve, you had actually asked a question that I, I just realized I did not answer. So I apologize. Um, okay. Let me let me answer that question, and then Antoine, I want you to, to, to get your point across. But I first want to answer the question because I don't want it to seem like we're dodging. So, um, Steve, I think you asked um, basically, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong because like, I'm forgetting and I don't want to misrepresent your point. But you said something to the effect of um, if God, and I think you went to Isaiah chapter 44 as your first uh, right. scripture to show this, if, if God is saying that he did things by himself alone then Kev himself. yeah exactly then kevin how can you say or uh, how could you use a scripture like um colossians 1 16 to say that god used an agent to create the world when it right. says that he did things by himself i just want to i want to answer that um because it's, it's a great question first the reason why i went to um colossians 1 16 is to show from our perspective that god will use agents to do his will, but even though the agents technically do something, he says that he did it. An Old Testament example of that would be um, when, when God led Israel through the wilderness. Now, do you, what's your perspective? Do you believe that God, uh, Yahweh, brought Israel through the, uh, through the wilderness by himself? Uh, well, the scripture doesn't say that God brought the Israelites through the wilderness alone and by himself it's very clear the scriptures say that god had sent angels god had used angelic agency throughout the hebrew bible i believe that but the scripture i said 44 24 is very emphatic it says that he created all things yahweh in context who stretched out the heavens all alone who spread out the earth by myself so there's no text in the Hebrew Bible where the Israelites were brought out of Egypt and went through the desert and the wilderness. I brought you up alone and by myself because we know throughout those texts that God did use the angels uh, over and over again. It's, it's all through the Hebrew Bible that God spoke through the angels and set or appointed angels in their journey. 
Uh, I, I mean, I could just go on and on. I could start turning there, but I'm sure you know those scriptures. But it never says that God brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt all alone and by himself. That's the point. Well, in, in Judges chapter two, a couple of things I get your perspective on. And then this is going to be this is going to be my last comment before I let Antoine speak, because like I said, I don't want to I want to disrespect him when I know he want to get a comment off. So uh, Judges chapter two, verse one says this. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now, in this verse, it says the angel said, I will never break my covenant with you. And the angel was the one who specifically brought Israel out of the land. But in, in, uh, in Exodus, I got to grab the scripture. I don't have it off top. We, we can find scriptures where God himself says he did that. Right. So obviously, if you take both, if you take one scripture and you isolate it from another, you can make the argument that, hey, Kevin, the angel is the one who said he would not break his covenant with Israel. But then in another place, you can read, well, hey, Kevin, God is the one who said he would not break his covenant with Israel. So which is it? It's both like the two are not the two are not mutually exclusive. You know, God sent the angel to do his bidding. But because he sent the angel, he was acting in the will of God. But that, that's it from my perspective. Um, uh, Antoine, you said you had a comment you wanted to Okay, can I just respond real quickly to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sir. It's my fault, okay. Steve. My fault. So, yeah. so it's very clear. It says the angel of Yahweh, okay? Sure. And so obviously the angel is the messenger of Yahweh. And since angels are transcendent from human prophets, they could speak directly from you know, the Israelites, even holding conversations. So... When, when God said, you know, um, I lift you up from Egypt and you into, into the land of Egypt. Oh, so, hey, St sorry, Steve. Hey, hey, Aaron, could you mute your phone? There's, there's a lot of background going on. I can't hear It's like a stupid prophet could say, you know, I this and, you know, I'm sorry about that. as I pointed out also in Judges in my last debate, uh, the angel of the Lord could speak on a much more transcendent level than any human prophet. And so God could speak through angelic agency. Absolutely. But nowhere does this text say that I, Yahweh, brought you up out of the land of Egypt all alone and by myself. It doesn't say that anywhere. That's my point out of creation. And again, we're talking about the son as, as a, another distinct, you know, person. And I'm not talking about another distinct divine person, but a human son of God as a human Messiah. It says, that he has appointed or set the son to rule over the works of his hands. The context proves it's the father's hands. So therefore the son as a son did not create anything as a son or as a heavenly being because God our heavenly father is emphatic that he created all things alone and by himself and has appointed the son to rule over the works of his hands. Since scripture cannot contradict scripture, that's a problem for both Arianism and Trinitarianism, because you both hold the same, or semi-Arianism, you both hold the same kind of view where there's an agent in creation that did the creation for God the Father, when God the Father emphatically said that he created all things alone and by himself, and everything was created by the works of the Father's hands, and the Son was appointed to rule over the works of the Father's hands. So these are emphatic scriptures, and you, you can't say that God brought the children of Israel through the desert alone and by himself, because God never said that. And then I would challenge anyone to find a verse that says that God the Father brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, of course, by an outstretched arm, but he used angelic agency. He never said he did it alone by himself. Go ahead, Antoine. You said you had a, a comment. Appreciate that answer, Steve. Thanks. Can I be heard? Give me you're, 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 you're in, you're in robot right, mode. 20 you're, you're, minutes. You're in robot mode. You can't hear, hear you. me? You're in robot mode. We can't hear you. <laughs> it's tough. It's, it's tough. Uh, try to spit it out fast. Maybe somebody can interpret. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yep, you're clear. You're can clear right now. Yep, you're can clear. Hear me? Go ahead. Try it. I think it, I think it was my head. But no, no. I, um, I got it. Jimmy, 
can't hear you. You have to forego, I think. I can't hear you. Next time. I, maybe you could type out a question if somebody can read it for you. Hey, Anton, you're breaking up again. Can't hear anything. Yeah, dude, we can't hear you at all, man. We, at all. Just, we just can't hear you. I do it next time, maybe. Yeah. We just can't hear you. Not at all. Well, I, th you wanna type go back to I think we should go on. I, I don't think we should continue. Uh, when, when we're talking about uh, Colossians, um, that word in uh, there, what I was trying to ask, and maybe you said and I didn't hear it, maybe I'll bring it up. Uh, I just I got I gotta wait till I get to a better area. Yeah, I can't hear you good at all. Very low. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could kill the time and just keep talking because nobody wants your dead time. Yeah. But not to to your point, Steve, because I do I do when we have these kind of uh, conversations, I want to acknowledge when people make great points, and you made a great point in Isaiah chapter 44, 24. Uh, Cause without a doubt, it says that the Lord, you know, and I'm reading, I got many Bibles. I, I'm like you, I, you know, I don't, I don't stick with the King James. I read many Bibles. So right. I'm reading out of the NASB. And to your point, this is what it says. And it doesn't contradict what you said at all. It says, thus says the Lord, your redeemer and the one whom, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord am the maker of all things stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. So without a doubt, like if I'm going to be honest with the scripture, that verse says that the Lord may stretched out specifically stretched out the heavens all by himself and spreading out the earth alone. Um, that's a great point. I don't have an answer for you right now. So it's something that I got to look more into, but I, I want to acknowledge that, that you did make a great point and, and I wasn't running from it. Thanks Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also hey, Kevin, oh, uh, I wanted to ask a question. You you guys are under the impression that uh, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, right? Yeah, that's my that's my impression. Right. OK, so uh, now I understand that Steve does not believe that way. But uh, if if you guys believe that Jesus is the, the God of the Old Testament, is it possible that Christ could actually actually have been speaking at this point or do is that not? Well, well, here's the thing, like, you know, in, 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 in an effort to be, to, to not deviate too much from the scripture, um, I could make that argument, but Steve had already, he's already spoken, uh, he's already given his, con his counterpoints to that, right, and in, in not in, in many words. So I just, I want to acknowledge this specific scripture because it says, stretching out the heavens by myself. Right now, I don't have an answer for that. And I'm the type of person where if somebody makes a good point, I'm going to acknowledge it and say, I'll do further study on it. That's good. That's a call of noble heart to just be honest with the scriptures. That's very good. We all need to yep. be, try to challenge myself. Yes, too. Somebody makes a good point. I so have to. You know, I remember when I was younger, I was debating with like the <laughs> witnesses. That the divine name should never have been taken out of the Bible. And I had to agree with them. That's why when I see capital L O R D, I would say Yahweh. I, For I sure. an excellent point. I think the divine name should be in there. And I, I can't, when somebody says something right, I can't argue with them. It makes sense. I'll learn from anyone, but I make sure it's in the Bible. I like to say, no script, no lip. If you don't, if you don't <laughs> uh, no script, don't give me your lip. Make sure you're going to teach just like what the Bible says. I think we have hearts that if I'm honest, it'll lead us to more truth, escape error. Like I was telling Aaron, the, the word of God is like a big jigsaw puzzle. And, and a lot of it seems to make sense. And then you get to one area and it just don't fit. And if it doesn't fit, there's something wrong with the whole theological outlook. It's got to fit 100% with the totality of all the scriptural data. And I just wanted to share two scriptures. That Aaron. Go ahead. Uh, Titus 2.13 says, while we wait for the blessed Lord, yeah. period of glory, 
our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 3, 13 says, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And 2 Peter 1, 1 says, uh, to those through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received the faith as we are. So the scripture says, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when Philip asked, show us the Father be sufficient for us in John 14, 7 through 9, Jesus responded by saying, have I been so long a time with you and have you not known me, Philip? What's the Father? Have I been so long time you not know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. He wasn't saying that his physical flesh was the Father or his human spirit was the Father, but he was saying that his, his identity is that God who became one of us, and that's why Philippians 2.6 says, he did not consider it robbery, to be equal with God. Now, the word equal means is the Greek word esos, which means the same as God. The same word esos is used in Acts eleven seventeen. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as he gave us, esos is translated as the same gift. We know the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the Gentiles is the same gift of the Holy Spirit that was poured out upon the Jews. So in Philippians 2, 6, the Son did not consider it robbery to be the same as equal, the same as God. So it was as a human son, he knew his true divine identity, being considered robbery or something to be grasped after to consider it himself to be equal or the same as God. Now, since Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God, there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. For Jesus to consider himself the same as God, well, that would be a violation of Isaiah 46, 9. And again, Jesus hears and answers prayers, and he fills New Testament believers. God has sent forth the spirit of his son in our hearts, crying out a father. So how could Jesus be in the hearts of all New Testament believers without being omnipresent? And the only one we know in the Bible who fills the heavens and the earth is Yahweh, God, our heavenly father. That would make Jesus Christ a manifestation of the face or the person of the father in a true human existence. That's why he could claim divine prerogatives. For sure. Appreciate it. Antoine, you were going to say something? I, I thought I heard your voice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah I was going to say. I, was going to say I don't want to hug up the tongue. I want you guys to hear from you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, was, I was going to say to Aaron, I don't know how well y'all can hear me. I was going to say to Aaron, like, it'll be too easy for us to just say that, oh, we believe that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament, which we do. And um, this is the but, God of the Old Testament. It doesn't sound like you believe he is. He's another God? Or what do you mean? Another God beside the Father? Me, personally? We, no, I'm answering this question from earlier. I was saying that, yes, we do believe that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. But when I'm, we're having a conversation with, with him. I'm trying to meet him on the same plane that he's on. So when he's saying what he's saying, like, I, I understand what's, what, he's, you know, what, he's, what he's getting at and where he's going. Um, I don't. I, I wanted to to break down the. Uh, Col I had some questions about Colossians, um, uh, more so. But my, my, my stuff is just is breaking up too bad. But yes, we do believe that Jesus is that God, is the God of the Old Testament. That's what we do believe. And uh, but I had a question of, what what do you say when people come? Uh, this is for Richie. Uh, what do you say when people come and they're like, uh, uh, well, if, if 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 God is saying all of this stuff in the Old Testament. But Christ is telling us that nobody's ever talked to God. We don't even have any concept of the Father until, you know, I'm mean, basically I'm introducing you guys to the Father. Um, what do you do? With, well, what is your response to people who uh, come at, at it in that angle? Come at the angle of introducing you to the Father. Well, we got to remember that. I'm not sure I understand where I would like to ask further, but how you say Jesus is God of the Old Testament. We would consider that there's only one God, our Heavenly Father. John 17, 3 says, Jesus prayed to his Father saying, you are the only true God. So there's not more than one God. So the only true God is our Heavenly Father. And Jesus Christ is the human visible image of that invisible God that we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. We behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus but Jesus, when God became a son, God became a child born and son given. That child born and son given had the same human cognition, the same mental, uh, physical laws 
in his human body that all humans had. That's why Luke 2.52 says that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. I'm sure no one would believe that Jesus popped out of Mary out of her virgin womb and started speaking Aramaic and all the languages of the world and he just knew all things. When the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things, they were just, they knew that Jesus had the answers to the spiritual questions they asked, but they never believed that he was omniscient or all knowing. That would contradict so many scriptures, like in Mark 13, 32, which says, no man knows the day or the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. No, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So our Heavenly Father alone is the only omniscient, all-knowing God. The Holy Spirit has to be the Spirit of the Father, because it doesn't say the Holy Spirit is another divine person who also knows. It says the Father alone knows the day or the hour. So God as God outside the virgin conception knows all things. But Emmanuel, God with us in a true human existence, that son did not know all things. He had to receive revelation. So Jesus explained who the Father was. He said, the words that I speak, I speak not on my own, but the Father who sent me gives me the words to speak. Paraphrase a little bit. That's basically what Jesus said. So as a true human son, Jesus did not speak as God. As God, he spoke as a son, as a man who had divine revelation about his true divine identity, which is why he said in John chapter 8, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And then in John 8, 58, before, they said, you have not even, you're not 50 years old. Have you seen our father Abraham? He said, truly, truly, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. And he was speaking Aramaic, so the Jewish audience picked up stones to stone him because they knew what he was saying based on Exodus, uh, th was it 30, 34, 12, where God said, I am that I am has sent me to you. I think it was 32 or 34. I forgot the exact chapter and verse. So, you know, when you look at the scriptures in John 14, it's so emphatic that Jesus claimed to be his divine identity claimed to be the father. And if you, if we just go there real quickly, um, it says in John eight, verse 16, the father sent me John eight seventeen. the father sent me John verse 19. The Jews asked, where is your father? He repeatedly said the father sent him. So for a prophet to say the father sent me, they all knew that they all knew that. But then the scripture goes on to say, uh, when they said, where is your father? Jesus replied in verse 23, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. The word he is not in the original Greek here. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And then in verse 25, they said, so they were saying to him, who are you? See, they were asking, who are you, Jesus? Who do you claim to make yourself to be? Who are you? And then in verse, 17, verse 27, it says, they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Now, they knew that he said that the Father sent him. The Father sent him again and again. The only rational explanation in the context is, who are you, Jesus? They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Then you go on in verse 58, that he kept proclaiming who he was. And, and then the Jews asked, you're not 50 years old yet. Have you seen Abraham? He said, truly, truly, before Abraham was, I am. That's when they knew he was speaking to them about the Father. That's when they decided, I'm going to take stones. But before, earlier in the chapter, in verse 24, verse 27, they didn't understand he was talking about his identity as the Father. But when he said, before Abraham was, I am, and he was speaking Aramaic, they recognized the book of Exodus, and they said, whoa, you're using the same words that God used. Where are the stones? Let's kill this guy. He's a blasphemer. But they didn't realize the scriptures, like in Zechariah 12, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And the context shows it was Yahweh who said they shall look upon me whom they pierced. So we don't believe that Jesus Christ is God as God. We believe Jesus Christ is God with us in true and full human existence. Not half God and half man, not God just thrust in the external body of flesh, but a true human will, a true human nature, because God became a child born. God became a son given, which is a miracle. I can't explain all the details, but all I do is I put all the scriptural data together and it comes in perfect harmony with the scriptures declaring Jesus having a God, being led up of the spirit in the world is to be tempted by the devil. He could not be doing that as God, but as a true human son, he did it. But at other times he spoke with divine prerogatives 
And Isaiah 46, 9 says, I'm God, there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. He hears and answers prayer, John 14, 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. He sends the Holy Spirit, Luke 24, 49. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I send the promise of my Father. This is the promise of Joel 2, 28. And John the Baptist said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So who else but the divine identity can send the Spirit of God the Father? No created being can send the Spirit of God and also dwell in our hearts by faith. Christ Jesus dwells in us, according to Romans 8 and so many other passages. So Steve, qu Steve, question. This, this question kind of, I think, goes a little bit outside the scope of what we were talking about, but I I'm curious um, on your perspective about this. So what's your, what's, whether it be you or your church or whoever, uh, whatever people think like you do, do you believe that when, do you, first, do you believe that Jesus is God now? That's the first question. Second, do you believe that when people, when the righteous die and are resurrected, do you believe that they will be gods as well? Um, you're, I don't believe that the concept that you're talking about, you know, we shall be as gods, that's different from the true God. You know, it's a different context. Uh, I believe Jesus Christ is not God in the sense of a lesser God. When it speaks of his deity, like I said, before Abraham was, I am. It didn't say before Abraham was, I was, and I left heaven. By saying before Abraham was, I am, he's saying, I am the God of the living. I'm still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's why Jesus could claim in John 3.13 to be up in heaven and on earth at the same time. He used his virgin conception titles such as Son of Man, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Jesus was in heaven and on earth at the same time only because his true identity is that God. Not a lesser God, not a demigod, not a not a like a lesser God, like even God said to Moses, I'll make you an Elohim to Pharaoh. Okay, we all know that Moses wasn't literally God, but make him as a God, so to speak, but not the true God. So just because you can find some verses that might say that, you know, behold, you are gods, you know, like gods, it's not the same thing as the title for the true God. We all understand that Moses was not the true God when God said, I'll make you as an Elohim, as a God to Pharaoh. We know that we're not talking about the same God just because the word God is used for a man as for God, the father himself. Uh, that's why I think it's so important that we use the divine name Yahweh because, uh, I think that we need to, you know, which literally means a self-existent one. We need to identify the God and Father who we believe in. And so uh, Moses is certainly not God the Father because it says, I'll make you a God. And I think that the passage you're probably going to cite is in John, uh, I think, out of Psalms where you, sh you should be as gods. And, uh, well, well, my, well, my question, and that's exactly where I'm going, but my question, my question was, to, was not to try to, uh, not to try to address the idea of Jesus pre-existence. That's why I said my questions are outside, uh, slightly outside the scope of what we've been talking about. I was just curious to see what your perspective is on what people will be called when they're resurrected. Because if the concept of, and this is, again, this is, I'm truly not trying to address the, the pre-existence of Jesus issue, but the concept of a lesser God, I see that in the scripture uh, whether it be cited in, in Psalm chapter 82, verse 6, and then when Jesus quotes that in John chapter 10, verse 34. Again, none of this has, none of this specifically addressed the preexistence of Jesus. I acknowledge that. It was just a point of curiosity on my part to see what you thought about that. Okay, Kevin. Well, anything else? I've done a lot of talking, so I want to let you guys uh, say some more things if you would like. And... Well, for me... Um, I don't really have much else. Like I said, you know, I appreciate, um, I appreciate you, you coming on, giving your perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Did somebody call my name? Yeah. Did some, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Antoine. Yeah, no, I just wanted to restate my question again because I don't think you fully understand what's trying to ask and I probably didn't get it across well enough. Uh, what I was what I was asking was, um, say for instance you're having a conversation who believes that no uh, the son came and told uh, 
what do you say to people? Well, how do you how how does your conversation go? Or what do you say when somebody says, "Well, somebody knew the father and knew the father until Christ came"? Who was this God that was talking in the Old Testament that people were talking to or said said this or said this that? Uh, what do you say to that? That's what I was getting at when I was uh, when I was trying to answer your question. I want to get your understanding as to when people say that. Okay, could you just say it one more time? I'm having a hard time picking you up. Say, say it one more time. What do I say to people when what? The, the, um, for instance, if someone asks asks you, all right, nobody they, they say to you, nobody knew the father until until Christ came. They didn't know about the father, and Christ was telling them about the father. Um, well, in that in that aspect. When you go back to the Old Testament and uh, and reference that we see all the time in the Old Testament that you know the Father is being referenced and you know so on and so forth. Uh, what do you, what do you say then? I got your question now. I couldn't hear you too well. Um, well, Jesus said in John four twenty three twenty four, the hour is coming now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. And he was t talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. And he said, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So the Jews right. knew about God as our father. They knew about him. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew what they worship for salvation is of the Jews. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers of the Father will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in a different, deeper way, fulfilling the prophets, that all will know me, not just the prophets, but all will know me from the least to the greatest, because I'll put my spirit upon their hearts and the tablets of their hearts. So I believe that the Jews always knew who God was. They never knew a trinity, that's for sure. And they always knew that God was only one, that Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, Lord, Yahweh, your God is one Yahweh. Yahweh means the self existent one. So you could translate it as, here Israel, the self existent one, your God is one self existent one. So we don't have one true God and another true God beside him. We only have one true God, our Heavenly Father. And when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the Lord, Galatians 4 4. And how was the Son made? The Son was made, Hebrews 2 17. The, the God who was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 1 Timothy 3, 16, partook of flesh and blood, Hebrews 2, 14, to share in our humanity, verse 15, to be made fully human in every way, like unto all human brethren, in Hebrews and 2, could, 17. And could, you again, and could you again for me, because I'm, I, um, I'm, I'm at this is far, uh, could you again reconcile that with uh, Colossians about him being the firstborn of all creation? Yes. The firstborn, Pertatikos, is talking about the firstborn of all creation the same way that Jesus was the lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world. Before the creation actually took place, God already called forth his son as his chosen servant. Then he chose us in him as, as human beings. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4, and he predestined us through Jesus Christ. So Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1.20, just like God's elect were foreordained before the foundation of the world. But in God's sight, he was the firstborn in his, in his logos, in his divine utterances before the foundation of the world, just like he was the first slain. That's why I just uh, cited Colossians 1.18. He is the firstborn from the dead. So if Jesus was already the firstborn at the beginning. It says the beginning, arche, the beginning the firstborn from the dead. So if Jesus was in the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that means he literally died and was slain. Now we know he wasn't literally slain. He didn't literally die before the virgin conception. And the same thing is true in Pertatikos in verse 15, the firstborn of all creation. God first created his foreordained plan in which the son was his central purpose and reason. And he chose all of his elect throughout the human ages in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. Otherwise, you'd have a contradiction of the scriptures that talk about the Son being appointed to rule over God, the, the works of God, the Father's hands, in uh, 
Hebrews 2, 7, and uh, Psalm 8, 5, and 6, and again, Isaiah 44, 24, that God stretched forth the heavens alone and by himself, and he created all things, I see it, 64, 8, by his own hands. And the Son is appointed to rule over the works of the Father's hands. So that's a contradiction for both Trinitarianism and for those that believe in a semi-Aryan or Aryan belief that Jesus is some sort of lesser heavenly being that God uses an agent to create all things. It refutes both Trinitarianism and Arianism, uh, which I don't know if you subscribe to the word Arianism, but it's a similar type of view that the Aryan or semi-Aryans believed in. Jesus is a created being, and then God used that created being to create all things as another true God or a lesser God person. So, Steve, real quick, just, um, just so I make sure I'm following, the, do you believe in the concept of lesser gods in the heavenly realm because like i said no, before i go okay, ahead hey, antoine my bad you got it you were gonna say something no no go ahead well i, I just wanted to, i just wanted to make sure that I, he was saying something and then you could go right into yours i just want to make sure i heard him correct i'm in a really bad area so i know my stuff about to cut back out i was saying i was, I was just trying to ask uh you were saying so when what you, from your understanding that when it says the firstborn of all creation, that means he was basically the first thought in the father's mind. More than a thought, um, you know, in God's sight, Romans 4, 17, God calls the things that be not as though they were. That's why we see all these messianic prophecies. They pierce my hands and feet. Uh, they look upon my bones. They stare upon me, you know. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's in Psalm 22, 1. That's the exact words that Jesus said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So God calls the things that do not exist if they already existed. And so Jesus was already the firstborn in God's God's predestined, ordained plan. Yes. So you're saying he's the firstborn well, of predestined plan. Was spelled out by God before the world even was created in the Genesis act of creation in Genesis 1. So, so simply put, you're saying that he, that Christ was the firstborn of God's plan. The Father's Absolutely. plan. That's, that's the context, and that's what means the firstborn from the dead. You know that Jesus wasn't literally the Lamb. Okay, yeah, yeah we, we, uh, we definitely, we, we don't, we don't uh, see the firstborn of the dead. And, um, all right, go, go ahead, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, we, we definitely view uh, firstborn of the dead as talking. We believe that it's like almost like a sequence of events type of scenario, but my service is terrible. I know y'all can probably barely hear me. I'll let Kevin go ahead to his his uh his his question that he had. I'm sorry, I'm about to mute myself. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I was just gonna say uh well a couple of things. First, um like I said, Steve, um in this conversation, you know, and in any conversation, I, I think it's it's important to acknowledge all points that we could possibly acknowledge as we remember them. And I'll reiterate, you made a really good point about Isaiah chapter 44, 24. So from my perspective, if I'm going to ask you anything else about this particular topic, I have to address that. Right now, I can't. So I'm not going to ask you any questions, any further questions about this specific topic because I have to I have to reconcile Isaiah chapter 44, 24, if at all possible. That's going to require me doing further study in the future. But I did want to ask this question, which is which, again, really, really doesn't connect uh, directly with the topic at hand. Um, when you talk about lesser gods, right? Jesus or John chapter 10, verse 34. And when he quoted Isaiah, uh, uh, Psalm chapter 82, verse six, I believe seems to indicate that Jesus believes in the idea of lesser gods, you know, gods that obviously aren't Yahweh. Do you believe that? Um, because I, 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 it wasn't clear to me whether you believe Jesus right now is a God or if when, when uh, righteous people who are uh, resurrected will also be gods. All right. You're referencing John 10, 34, was it? Correct. I'm referencing John 10, 34 and... Uh, I think he quotes uh, Psalms 82, 6. Yeah, yeah, I figured that. Yeah, it is written in your law, I said you are gods. Well, of course, there be many gods, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, though there be many gods, many lords, many gods, many, but to us there's only one true God. That is the Father. So, you know, like I said, Moses could be called a god to Pharaoh, but he's not the true God. 
people can sometimes be referenced to as Elohim, as, as God, but not necessarily the true God. So there's a good point there, too. Uh, just because the word God is placed on somebody doesn't mean it's talking about the true God. And so that is a good point as well. But when you have someone like, you know, when you have the Messiah stating before Abraham was, I am, well, that's, that's pretty emphatic. Or he that has seen me has seen the Father. No human prophet, but Moses was the greatest prophet, perhaps, out of all the prophets. Enoch was also one of, a great prophet. Nobody ever, prophet that we know of, ever said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. No great prophet ever said before Abraham was, I am. Uh, Jesus is the only one of a kind, unique son of God, who is the only visible image of the invisible God that we will ever see. We behold the glory of God through the face of Jesus. The only way we can see the Father is through Christ. He's the only visible image of God. So it's so important that Hebrews 1, 3, it talks about Jesus being the brightness of Pagasma, the reflected brightness of his, speaking of the Father in context. Just like the moon takes the sun's rays and shines down at us at night, so Jesus reflects the Father's glory. He is the Pagasma, the reflected glory of God the Father. He is the brightness of his glory. He expressed character, copied image in the Hebrew, in the Greek, I'm sorry. Character means a copied image of the Father's hypostasis, of the Father's being or person. So God made a copied image, and this is exactly what we believe if God became a son. God became a man to save his people from their sins. And when we use anthropomorphic language, we find that Jesus is called the arm of Yahweh revealed. Jesus is a manifestation or extension of the Father into this world, not as God, but Emmanuel, God with us as a true human child born and son given who had to have the capacity to sin, the capacity to be tempted by the devil, the capacity to pray and have independent reasoning from the divine spirit of the father. That's why it says in John 5, 26, as the father has the divine life in himself, so also is he granted the son life in himself. So though there be gods many and lords many to us, there's but one God, the father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And one Lord Jesus Christ. Christ means the anointed one. So the anointed one is not the same thing as saying the Father. The anointed one is not the same thing as saying a co-equal God person like a God, the Son, like a Trinity. Jesus is anointed by his God as a child born and son given. So we believe in the true and full humanity of Jesus Christ. We don't believe oneness people. We don't believe Jesus is an angel. But to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, this day have I given birth to you? We don't believe that Jesus is a lesser God. We believe Jesus Christ is that true God that was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 1 Timothy 3, 16, who came down from heaven, John 6, 38, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven, according to Luke 1, 35, Matthew 1, 20. It never says that an angel or a lesser God person came. It never said that a God the Son came down on the virgin. It said the Holy Spirit came down. That's the spirit of God, the father who character copied a human image of himself in the Hebrew virgin, as the early writings of Ignatius had said that Jesus Christ is both of the seed of David from the woman and of, from the Holy spirit. But, the, Holy spirit. but just a, a, a quick, a quick, uh, um, you know, follow up. You reference first Corinthians eight, Verse five, where it says, for though there be many, for though there be that, or, excuse me, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and many lords, many. The context of that verse is dealing with idols. That's not the context of John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 34 is not, is not talking about idols. It's drawing a connection between human beings and lesser gods, not idols. So, if you're going to reference 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, I think we have to make known that the context that Paul is talking about is, is idolatry, mm -hmm. whereas in, in John chapter 10, the context is not idolatry as far as, uh, at least, as, at least uh, from the standpoint of when Jesus says, uh, it is, not writ uh, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods. That phrase is not talking about idolatry in uh, Psalm chapter 80, 82, verse 6. So again, my... My question, my question doesn't really change your ultimate perspective, right? All I'm saying is when I read the Bible, like when, when, when righteous people die, when they're resurrected, 
they're going to be called gods, just like Jesus is called God. Now, again, I have to reconcile Isaiah chapter 44, 24. So I'm not trying to backdoor, um, you know, my perspective into this conversation when I have not addressed that point. I was just looking to see what your perspective was on the concept of lesser gods, because it seems that the Bible is pretty clear that you have a hierarchy. You have Yahweh, you have gods underneath that, and then you have angels. That's the only, that's the only reason why I brought it forth, because um, it seems to me that you, you, you view the celestial hierarchy as God and then the rest of them angels. Um, I'm looking. Where is the verse I'm looking at? The scripture says, I'm trying to find it right now, that there's no God beside me. Um, there's no Savior beside me. Okay? So while the scripture can say that, you know, we can be called gods, there's no true God beside our Heavenly Father. I'm trying to look for the verse I had here. Uh, Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am Yahweh, there is no other. There is no God besides me. Okay. So what the context of that is talking about, there's no true God besides me. These other gods are just little petty gods. If you want to call them gods, a human being could be called a God. I'm an Elohim. Moses could be called an Elohim. But beside me, there's no God. And then Isaiah 43, 10, 11, it says, Yahweh said, you are my witnesses. It says, Yahweh, my servant, I've chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and beside me, there's no Savior. So beside God, Yahweh, there is no God. Beside God, Yahweh, there is no Savior. Now, what we're talking about is no Savior of the world beside God the Father. Beside God, there is no true God. So if Jesus Christ right now, according to Acts chapter uh, 2, verse number 30. Four is now ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. He is beside the Father, and he is the Savior of the world. And Jesus Christ is called God, which you will admit throughout the, the New Testament and also in the Hebrew Bible. Therefore, it says, since God the Father said there's no God beside me, that means Jesus has to be the divine identity as the Savior of the world, the only Savior. Of course, many little saviors and deliverers in the book of Judges but the Savior, how did, G how did Jesus save us? He saved us by his precious blood to give us salvation. And since G God is the only true Savior, and there's no Savior beside him, there's no God beside him, that makes Jesus Christ identical with God because he has to be that God to be able to have the title of the Savior of the world and, uh, and, and called the God, uh, over again, our God, uh, where it says... Uh, uh, before Abraham was, I am, and so forth. It's very clear that Jesus called our great God and Savior in Titus chapter 1 and, and 1 Peter. So our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We put all the scriptural data together. We find Jesus isn't just a little God, <laughs> like a human, any human being could call, like El, uh, Moses could be called, like God to Pharaoh. Christ is called the true God in eternal life, John one uh, John five twenty. One John five twenty. He has given us understanding. We may know him as true. We are in him as true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God, eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So many references talk about Jesus Christ as as God. He is not God with us as God. He's God with us as a true human existence. So we got to have a distinction. Understand the distinction between the Father and the Son, because we don't believe that Jesus is just God thrust in a body of flesh not be true at all because he had a true human nature that was able to be tempted you're saying you're saying that you're saying that it was impossible for god to be thrust into a human flesh say what you say that it's impossible for that to happen all things are possible with god uh i don't believe the flesh of jesus is ontologically god okay. i believe it's, it's you know the bible says in acts 20 that I got you. I got you. I, I thought you were saying. I got you. I thought I, I understand what you're saying. I thought you were saying that it that it wasn't possible for that to, to be the case. 
No, all things are possible. I mean, God is a miracle God. He can do whatever he wants. Uh, but Acts 20 talks about the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. And so, though there's some variant readings on that, uh, it's very clear that there are every place in the New Testament. I remember reading the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. It was 10 times it says, um, it talks about the church of God throughout the New Testament. Amen. You never find the church of our Lord. So that is more than likely the reading of the text in the original in Acts 20, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Not that the blood of Jesus is ontologically God, but the blood of Jesus or the body of Jesus belongs to God as the only physical image revealed to man. Also, I yeah, I wanted to ask you a question, Steve. Uh, so, what uh, what was your understanding on um, on Isaiah sixty one and one, where it talks about the the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach um, to the poor? I'm not quoting it verbatim, but uh, Spirit of Yahweh is on me because Yahweh has anointed me to. Proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to build up the brokenhearted, you know, etc. I was just wondering what your understanding on that was, because um, I've heard Trinitarians use that. Uh, it's, they they try to say that it, it's Yahweh speaking, and then Yahweh is saying that the spirit of Yahweh is up is upon me. So how is how are there like two Yahwehs in that in that verse? Yeah. Because what I what what I think I'm what it seems to me is it seems like um, I see like a distinction between Christ and and the Father, but because of how they work as in unity, it, like Christ can speak as if you know. Then there's where those scriptures come in where God says like He does certain things, but Christ is is Yahweh, so if so He can speak as if it if He's done it by himself although because you know part of the trinitarian argument you know like sam shimon would say well who is who else is three and one so he so when he says that i alone has done it he would just say that it's you know well jesus is yahweh so so it it would be the same thing i don't know if that makes sense <laughs> this is isaiah 61 is a messianic passage of prophecy where the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God would be upon the Messiah and the spirit of God would anoint the Messiah to preach the good tidings on the earth as a man. It's not talking about a pre-incarnate Messiah here. To proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison to those who are bound, the preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, so it's very clear that, you know, Jesus Christ as a true human son, as I said before, was anointed by his God and had the spirit of God. Matthew 4, 1 says, that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So who is the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father. Jesus said, the Father dwelling in me, he does the works. So it's not the third God, the Holy Spirit, called the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father. And so it's it's very well, clear to me that, that there's only one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father, above us all, through us all, and in his soul, Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. And that spirit led right, so it isn't it isn't Yahweh speaking uh, in that verse right there. That's a prophecy. No, this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. The spirit right. upon me. No, G these Jesus right, I understand that. speaking there in the Hebrew Bible. That's just that's just a prophecy because God calls the things as being not as though they were. The Lord has anointed me. See, a lot of times we look at scripture, look at look at Psalm 22. You have been my God from my mother's womb. They, they pierce my hands and feet. You, Psalm 22 is a powerful messianic. It's almost all messianic there. And so all these messianic prophecies almost all speak as, as if it already happened. You know? Mm -hmm. So but by saying they pierce my hands and feet doesn't mean that Jesus' feet and hands were literally pierced during the Hebrew Bible time or during the time of King David. What this is talking about, the same thing in Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord would be upon Jesus in the future. Oh. Uh, and anointing right. them in the future. And it's also talking about preaching the gospel, preaching the good tidings and setting the captives free. We know that Jesus Christ didn't set the captives free in the Hebrew Bible. He came and preached and set the captives free and healed the sick. 
during his earthly ministry. And that's what it's all talking about in Isaiah 61 and many other passages. And Trinitarians often confuse this and see that they say, oh, the son spoke here. See, the son said this. But meanwhile, it says in Hebrews 1, 2, that, that God spoke at top past to the Israel answers to the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through his son. So it was only during the last days which God began to speak to us through his son. And it says in uh, Acts 2, it shall come to pass the last days, says God, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. So the last days was around the time of Jesus, the beginning of the last days. And on the day of Pentecost was called the beginning of the last days. That's when God poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And that's the fulfillment of Jesus Christ coming was in these last days, not as a son in the Hebrew Bible throughout Genesis to Malachi. Only he was only predicted the Messiah or the coming of the Messiah, but he didn't actually exist as a Messiah before the virgin conception. Right. And now is, is Christ and, and God, uh, since they're both in heaven, are, are they separate beings or how does that work for you? The definite distinction. Yes. You, you, you know, it says thou art after the order of Melchizedek. Once God assumed a new human life in himself, you got two lives here. John 5, 26 says, as the father has life in himself, so also has he granted the son a life in himself. So we got one God and one mediator to God and then the man Christ Jesus. That's two. We don't have two God persons. We got one God, our heavenly father, the only true God, according to John 17, 3. That one God produced a human image of his essence of being as a true human son who had to have independent cognition, independent human will, independent human reasoning. Now, if Jesus, as Trinitarians say, had a pre-virgin conceived God will, you'd have two and three God minds, two and three God wills, which would be tritheistic. God only has one divine mind, one divine heart, one divine soul, one divine will, but only when the Son of God was conceived in the virgin, that's when the Son had a human will, a human cognition, which could potentially disagree with his Father, could potentially be against his father. That's why he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. You see, that was the two wills, one God will and one man will. But as far as two and three divine minds, that's a Trinitarian heresy. That's a tritheism. So there, sir, so are there, are there two minds right now, you're saying? One divine mind and one human mind, yes. Jesus Christ is always going to be human. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says only one God and one mediator, to be, mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is always going to be a man. Once, once God came down from heaven to produce a true human child born and son given, that child is still going to be a son. That, that son is still going to be a man throughout eternity in the future. God's never going to stop being that. He is, has an immortal body. He's the first fruits of those that slept. So he, his resurrected body is eternal. He's always going to be. And then we are his followers also have eternal resurrected bodies by living, overcoming Christian lives and believing his words. Okay. So, so, so basically evaporate into and lose his humanity. That, that would be not against scripture. Right. Right. Oh. And I mean, and clearly he's, he's just in a form of a man. He's not actually a human being right now because flesh can't enter the kingdom. Right. Well, no, his, 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 his body is a, a resurrected immortal body. He's not right. pretending to be a man. He still is a man. He still has a human spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute, Aaron. Okay. So that comment right there, I think I get where you're coming from, Steve, because your perspective is that even now in resurrected form, Jesus right now in the heavenly realms is a man, yes. but he has a celestial body for lack of a better term. Yes, a resurrection. Okay. Yes. So again, going back to John ten thirty four, where it says, "Ye shall be gods." Are, do you draw a distinction between the word God in that in that chapter and the word man? I don't look at that particular passage really relating to Jesus. I, I think that was just uh, in passing. I don't really see that as well. Well, let, let me just for the sake of the for the sake of the rest of us, let me read that because I've referenced it several times. Let me just read it and we can get the full context. Um, John chapter 10, 
Uh, I'll start in verse 31. It says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I shewed you from my father. For which, of the, for which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man, makest, thou, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, meaning other people, meaning the Jews, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said, I am, I am the son of God. In these verses, we know just by the context, when Jesus talks about ye are gods, he's not talking about idolatry at all. He's drawing a connection between the people to whom the word came and being gods. So if Jesus, and we know in, um, I think it's, uh, first John chapter three, where it says, uh, we don't know what, actually, let me just get out there. Cause I don't want to, um, I don't want to speculate. Let me just get out there. First John three. Um, yeah. First John three, uh, two says this beloved. Now, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So whatever, whatever body Jesus has is the body that we're going to have, right. assuming we make it into the kingdom. Right. But in John chapter 10, verse 34, he said, we are gods. So I don't see, I don't see the term God as synonymous with the term man. I see God as an elevated term, as an elevated uh, 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 category, elevated existence. But according to my understanding of your view, you seem like you don't you don't call Jesus a God or you don't call resurrected mankind a God. You still call him a man. Is that correct? Well, yes, generally speaking. I mean, I think what Jesus did here, you know, the scripture says in Isaiah 45, verily you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. And Jesus wanted to make sure that when he was talking that he hid his true divine identity so he'd fulfill his mission. Uh, so it is written in your law, you are gods. He used that scripture to evade uh, the accusations of the Jews uh, so that he, he was hiding his true divine identity, I believe there, without, you know, come out and say, yeah, I am God. Because so often Jesus did talk about himself, like I said before Abraham was, just a couple chapters earlier, I am. So... You know, the scripture says, behold, you are gods. I don't believe that he was trying to make himself a lesser God person here. I know that's that's what probably you're trying to get at there. Uh, but I, I truly believe that, you know, when they said you being a man, make yourself God. He was using evasive tactics to try to make sure that they did not uh, kill him before the time. And of course, Philippians says that he emptied himself of his divine rights and privileges. He emptied himself and humble himself to become obedient to the death of the cross. So if Jesus went around saying to everybody, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God, uh, he did say it sometimes, but he didn't do it a lot because he had to fulfill his mission. And like I said before in Philippians 2, 6, he did not consider it robbery to be equal, Esau's, the same as God. And so he's not talking about the same as another, a uh, lesser God person, but the same as God the Father in the context in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. But would you agree, would you agree that in the context of these verses, Jesus told the Jews, they are gods? You know, we because, can't, we could be considered that, but not, not, not true God, of course, but lesser gods in a sense. Like Moses, again, a good prime example, I'll make you a God to Pharaoh. Uh, we all know that Moses isn't a true God. It's just sometimes the scripture can call us that. But Jesus, again, in scripture, many, many times says there's no God beside me. So we're not talking about a true God person. We're talking about like a much lower level. And that's, that's my only point. Like, again, like I said, I'm not trying to backdoor uh, my comments into what, you know, our ultimate discussion is. Um, your point, your, you've stated your point very clear. Like there's one true God, Right. right? And you stated it very, and you showed again, referencing Isaiah chapter 44, 24, that when it came to the heavens and the earth, God, Yahweh created everything himself. 
my only point was to show because in the in the early part of our discussion i was unclear on how you viewed the celestial realm um again i view it as god you have god and then you have um you have uh lesser gods and when you have um and what i mean by lesser gods i mean in the context of when mankind is resurrected they're they'll be called gods because we're not gods now you see what i'm saying in the in the um in the most literal way, like to your point about Moses, yeah, the scriptures called, you know, Moses, God, obviously he's not a God, but yeah. Jesus, Jesus, uh, whatever he is, that's what will be. And, you know, I wasn't trying to make the claim that, you know, we're going to be Yahweh. Not at all. I hope, I hope I didn't leave that, leave you with that impression. Right. That's good. Yeah. I agree. with not there. That's good. Cool. And so, uh, I was wondering, so when we're talking about this whole God situation and this, I really think this this verse kind of addresses both sides because now I'm confused about the scripture that talks about how there will be no God form before me or after me. And so it, it seems as if, it seems as if now, if, if the God part is not in the same status as uh, the father, then it, it can make some sort of sense because the only true God is actually the Father. Yes. But when it comes to Christ becoming, um, it sounds to me like uh, Christ like became a God for Steve. And so Christ like starts to uh, become on the same level as Yahweh. And that's why, you know, later on in Revelation, it says that all creation actually praises Yahweh and the Lamb. Right. So, or it says, you know, praises God and the Lamb. Right. So if if Christ was not um, Yahweh from the beginning, then it seems as if he actually did form a God after him. Well, see, that's see, Jesus was not a God that was formed. Jesus was a man that was formed. And so Jesus many times, like he said, before Abraham was, I am. He, and he, he didn't he didn't say before Abraham was, I was like he was created at some point in time. He said before Abraham was, I am. That means he eternally, timelessly existed as God. And that's why he received the name of his father. God says he would not give his glory to another in the prophet Isaiah. So the name that Jesus has is the name of God, the father. That's why when it says baptize in the name of the father and of the son and Holy Spirit, the apostles always interpreted the name of Jesus Yahweh Hashua, and it's contracted form Yeshua, which means the self exists, the one saves. So Jesus has the name of his father. So Jesus, by inheritance, has obtained a more excellent name than the angels. So when we say that Jesus is God, we don't believe he is somebody that became a God as a lesser God. He has to be the timeless, eternal God, like Ignatius wrote to Polycarp in Polycarp 3 2. Look for him who is above all time, the timeless the invisible, who for our sake became visible. So before Jesus existed as a human son, he's always existed as the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15. He's the brightness of his glory, the Father's glory, and the express copied image of his person, Hebrews 1.3. So we don't believe that Jesus is a lesser God or a created God. His divinity has always timelessly existed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always timelessly existed. But as a son, as a man, he had a beginning, a human cognition, a human will. But before that, there was no son. There was no son of God, son of man. There was no lesser God person before the virgin conception. Jesus had his beginning only in the virgin conception, which is borne out by Luke 135. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. For that reason, the Holy Child should be called the son of God. So, so Steve, Steve, real quick to that point, because, um, you know, you said some things that are really interesting. Do you do you believe right now, currently, that Jesus um, is like is let me ask you this right now. Currently, we, we all can agree Jesus is in heaven. Right. Um, do you believe that Jesus currently is under the authority of the father? Yes. Okay, cool. Then we're in agreement because yeah. I wasn't yeah. sure. I wasn't sure if you believe that. The head that, of Christ but... is God. Christ yeah, is sure. still a man. He's still under the Father. Absolutely. For sure. Just, yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I thought I heard you say something else. But... Man on the throne 
the lamb will sit on that throne, the throne of God and of the lamb. There's only one throne in the millennial reign, not two and three. For sure. God's going to reign through Christ through eternity, through the millennial reign and through eternity, through the man, through the son. Right. Well, like I said, you know, I I don't have any any further questions, uh, at least for me. Other people might. But personally, Steve, I appreciate you, uh, you know, dialoguing with with us, specifically me. Um, this is for me. This is a super fruitful conversation. I got like a question, said, real quick, too, Kev. Where you go? Oh, you oh, now you super clear now. Stay where you are. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> stay where you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, my question, I, I, just to clarify, because like I've been in and out. My service has been in and out. My call is dropping. I have to call back in and all this stuff. Um, just correct. Just am I correct in saying you believe that Christ? existed just not as the son before his birth he existed before his virgin conception but not as a son not as a child born right. and given so what was he before his conception he always always existed as the mighty god as the spirit of the living god jesus so, christ's divine identity is emmanuel god with us as a true human son and if oh, you're, so, so you believe before you so you believe before he came in the flesh that he was God. Yes, the only true God, not another God. God the Father is the only true God. Jesus. So, so you believe? So you believe that Jesus was God the Father? Yes. Before he came in the flesh. Because yeah, and he still is. He, even in the virgin conception, he both. That's why he said, "I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob." He said, "Before Abraham was, I am." So he wasn't saying I was, and I left. I, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just trying to get what you. I'm trying to I'm pointing out what this clarify what you're saying. Jesus transcendently lived, you know, existed in the heavens, while simultaneously existing in a limited human capacity as a living Son of God who had to grow in wisdom and stature and faith with God and men. Inside his birth, so, so, so you're saying things. So you're, but, okay, I, I'm just trying to clarify what you're saying. So you're saying that Christ also was like, so like, for instance, when, um, when he was praying, like he was partially praying to himself in a sense. I'm just trying well, to. He did pray. As a man, he really was tempted by the devil. As a man, he really did pray. He wasn't pretending to pray. He had a true human life, which was granted in time. In John 5, 26, you know, as the father has life in himself. So he has granted the that's, son. That's not, that's not what I'm asking. Now. There are two lives, the divine life and a human yeah. life. If we are to believe that God became a son, God became a man, that man is not ontologically God. That man had to have a distinct human life. Otherwise, yeah. there would be no man. You couldn't call Jesus Christ a man if he was just God in a physical body, pretending to pray, pretending to be tempted. He really was praying. I, I, that, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but that, that, that wasn't what I was asking. What I was asking was, when he was praying to the Father, are you saying that he was partially praying to himself? Because you said, I believe, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you said he was partially in heaven? Partially. Well, I wouldn't use those words partially. I believe as a true human son, he really did genuinely pray to the Father. No, I'm not saying that. No, yeah, so the Father, you're saying that that was partially him. I mean, that was part him. I don't like to use words that are not scriptural. <laughs> Partially, well, it doesn't, I don't, I mean, I don't, we've been using a ton of words that aren't scriptural. scriptural words. I mean, is that, is, that, is, that, is that what you're saying, though? I mean, we don't have to use partial. You can find another word. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think I've seen simultaneous in there either, but you said yeah. that one, so I'm just trying to say. I'm, I'm just trying to, I mean, I, we, I mean, I don't have to be technical. I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. That is all. Except for my sake. I'm not partially. plugged in here. My battery's running low, so I'm going to run out. I'm going to be losing you pretty quick here. Um, so I'm going to have to sign off soon. But uh, no, I, I would say, you know, Jesus Christ as a true human being had to pray and had to have a God to whom he prayed or he would not be a true God at all. Hey, I would I never agree. say that Jesus prayed to himself. Uh, that's just not what we say in one's theology. Jesus prayed to his God as a true human son because Jesus did not pray as God. He prayed as a true human son. This is precisely what we believe that God became a man, God became a son. But I'm going to have to. Uh, I just realized so, I so myself that, in. I'm, out, I'm going to. I'm going to lose you real soon here. So I think we need to kind of conclude. Oh, I don't know how much time I got now, but uh, I'm almost dead on my. That's back. cool. We could. Uh, we could still. We could schedule another time. 
Yeah, yeah I'm getting fine. tired right now, and I do have things to do. But I think it'd be a good idea to schedule another time, maybe next week or something. It'd be good. Okay, no appreciate, problem. Uh, appreciate the time, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, for real. Thanks, Sharon. Appreciate you. Uh, Kevin yeah. and uh, Antoine, thank you. Thanks. Enjoyed the time and looking forward to more Steve. dialogue. Yeah, thank Likewise. you, Steve. And then, uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. Hopefully I'll see you soon. And then, um, yeah, I'll be in touch with them and you. We'll all figure something out. Okay, sounds great. I'd like to all right, brother. Good, good uh, introductory time. But uh, yes. like, I'd like to end with Isaiah 46, 9. I'm God and there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. And I like the point mm -hmm. that Jesus, you know, answered prayer, John 14, 14. If you should ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus does the works of God the Father uh, in that he sends the Holy Spirit. For 24, 49, he baptized with the Holy Spirit. How could any created or, or, or supreme, you know, super being that God made send the Spirit and not be God? Because Joel 2, 28, Yahweh said, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. We find Jesus the one that sends the Spirit that would make him the same as God. Hey, hey I've been trying to right. get in the whole time, and and I haven't, I hadn't been able to break in the whole time. And you're about to get off, and I just, I guess, I'll address everything uh, the next time you come on. This is uh, James, by the way, Steve. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you good, James. Yeah, you made the comment, the last comment. If it cuts off on us, that's fine. But you made okay. the comment about uh, God says He, uh, there's no other like me, and I think what I wanted to uh, bring to the table was. That in the sense, what do you mean there is no other God like me? He is, I, I believe in the Old Testament when that statement is made, it is, it is referring, it is in context of idolatry, and there is no other God that can redeem you. There is no other being, a heavenly being, deity that can redeem you like I can. It's not saying that there is no other God in existence. It's saying that there is no other God with the authority and the power to redeem, to bring you back from the dead but me. Right. But Yahweh. And sometimes you see in the Old Testament, I can show you, I'll go next time to these scriptures, where it's, I believe it's plainly showing two deities or two beings being called Yahweh in the same verse. Um, so you can see that somebody else is taking this authority of this name, Yahweh. And you can read uh, in Exodus where the angel of the Lord went before the people of Israel. And then you read where Yahweh went before the people of the, uh, Israel. Was it the angel of the Lord or was it y Yahweh? And sometimes the being that has come on behalf of the higher authority takes that name, that authority on them. And so they address them. And it's almost like that, that, that authority is speaking, but it's actually not, it's a messenger, but the Bible authors or the writers come across as it's almost Yahweh himself, because Jesus said, I didn't come of my own authority or my own name. He came uh, at, on the father's will. So that's why, when you look at Jesus, he's just, he's just doing what the father would be doing if he was here himself. So that's why you can see them. And what I'm trying to say is there, I think you can differentiate two deities and you can see that they're both called Yahweh and they have separate um, individual personalities, separate, you know, differences. That sounds but, so um, to the Hebrew Bible, two different deities. I mean, that's, you know, here are Israel, the Lord, the self is the one your God is one. So one. two different deities sounds like a monetarian doctrine as a two God doctrine. But I think if hopefully we can talk about that, the next discussion. Because well, the word deity, I just I'm trying to let me let me. Yeah, let me express what I mean by deity. Just uh, I would I would refer to heavenly anything that exists outside of this physical world is a spiritual being or whatever you want to call it. Um, they're, they're like you said, their angels are made of fire. I believe all these beings that exist. Uh, in the heavenly realms are made of different, they're composed of different elements or whatever. I can't even understand that, but it's different from us. Okay. The material, the physical clay or whatever we're made up in this world. I believe there are other realms. There are higher uh, levels of, of, of being that we are lower than. Um, and so when I say, did he, did he take off? Okay. Yeah. James, he left. He's no longer here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's cool. It's, his, yeah, but um, I'll get it. I mean, I was trying to. Then... Yeah, what happened to you? What's up? Oh, hey, hey, man, hey, hey, we we still we're still recording. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me turn it off. Yeah, for real. 